Welcome to Newsmax TV. I'm Ashley Martella, along with my colleague Kathleen Walter. We're joined by Newsmax contributor, noted political analyst, best-selling book author, and commentator Dick Morris. Dick, it's nice to have you with us in the Newsmax TV studio. It's nice to be here. Most of the time I've been doing these shows remotely from New York, and now I can actually meet you guys. Dick, it's great to see you. On the issue of health care reform, the American people have spoken, and polls show overwhelmingly that Americans don't want it. Do you predict Democrats will muscle through this legislation, and will it pass? George Bush once said when he was describing the war on terror that they have to win, we have to win all the time. They have to only win once. The terrorists only have to be right once. We have to be right all the time. Now it's the other way around. The Democrats have to pass every single hurdle to get this bill through, and we can defeat it at any of those junctures. So I think that what's likely to happen now is that the Senate will tie itself in knots debating this bill. And Reid and Obama will take out all of the controversial provisions and pass whatever Lieberman and Bayh and Lincoln and Landro and Nelson from Nebraska can vote for. They'll essentially let them write the bill. And when the liberals, like Jay Rockefeller, squawk and say this isn't liberal enough, they'll say, don't worry about it. We'll fix this in conference with the House. And I think that'll happen either by Christmas or maybe in the first couple of days of January. Then I think it goes to the conference committee. And that's where I think you really have a terribly difficult problem for Obama. Because he has to write a bill that can get 60 votes in the Senate and a majority in the House. So he needs to write a bill that Dennis Kucinich and Joe Lieberman agree on, which is going to be very difficult. Prolonged negotiations, getting closer and closer to the election, public opinion and support dropping on the bill week after week after week. And I think it may just absolutely die there. It may never come out of the conference committee. Or if it does, it may not be in a form where it can possibly pass. So uh, I think we have a long ways to go on this. The key thing for us to do now is not to fall for Obama's line that something's going to pass anyway, that this is inevitable. That's wishful thinking on his part. Dick, you mentioned in one of your columns of a couple of months ago that the seniors uh, hold the key to defeating Obamacare. Apparently that battle's been won now. Seniors are pretty much united against it. Now there's another key demographic group that comes into play here? Yes. Uh, as a result of the work that Newsmax and other groups, League of American Voters, did during July, August, and September, we really moved the national poll numbers on seniors to be against this bill. They began pretty much tied, and now it's two to one opposition. But the new group that we need to move and we're working on now are people under 30. See, they're the ones who actually are most affected by this bill. They're the ones that are going to have to spend $15,000 out of pocket to buy an insurance policy they don't need. They would like catastrophic care, but they don't want the whole soup to nuts thing. And if they don't, they have to pay a fine of 2.5% of their income. And if they don't, they face up to five years in prison. So when young people begin to understand that and that the subsidies to help them afford it only kick in after you've spent 8 to 12 percent of your income on premiums, when young people understand that, they move against it in droves. We had a fascinating thing that just went on. We were advertising about these issues aimed at young people in Arkansas, North Dakota, and Maine. And we polled before we were on and after we were on. And we succeeded in moving the young people's vote, people under 30, by more than 20 points against it. By the time we were finished, people under 30 opposed this bill by 25 to 60. Now our only hope is that we can run this all over the country. So far we're not able to afford to go on national network news. We need about a million dollars extra over the next three weeks to do that. But we can go on our current schedule in all of the swing states. Dick, can we deduct by what you said that uh, apparently a lot of people who supposedly support Obamacare really don't know what's in it? They don't know about the punitive aspects of it? Exactly. What, what happens is that young people in particular start off by saying, oh, it's idealism. Of course, everybody should have health insurance. It should be a right. Everybody should be covered, yeah, obviously. Then you go and you tell them you will have to pay $15,000 out of pocket or a 2.5% fine or go to jail. That you'll only get a subsidy after you've paid 8 to 12% of your income 
to buy this stuff. Then you may only want catastrophic insurance, but you have to buy insurance on everything so that your premiums can be used to subsidize those who are truly sick. And once you really explain that to young people, they back away from this very sharply. The interesting thing here is basically nobody between the ages of 30 and 64 is much affected by this because they're not on Medicare. Uh, they'll have some procedures that be rationed. But it's the young people that have to buy the insurance and the old people that face rationing that are really hurt by this bill. And uh, we need to get both of those groups mobilized to oppose it. And uh, the evidence in Arkansas and North Dakota and Maine indicates that we can do that. We just need to have the money to run the ad. Dick, do you feel that AARP sold out its members in endorsing Obamacare? Oh, absolutely. Here's the deal. Uh, there's a thing called Medigap insurance for anyone who wants coverage beyond what Medicare gives you. And it's pretty expensive, and it's provided mainly by the AARP that makes most of its money from it. Then about five years ago, Bush came along and said, this isn't very good coverage, it's far too expensive. I'm going to set up something called Medicare Advantage, which is voluntary, 10 million seniors have enrolled in it, lower premiums subsidized by the government, and managed in integrated care, preventative care, uh, counseling, all kinds of really great stuff. And, um, what, but it's not offered by the AARP. So Obama told the AARP, I will kill Medicare Advantage if in return you endorse the bill. And this bill takes $170 billion away from Medicare Advantage and forces people to buy Medigap insurance so they can pad the AARP's pocket. In your judgment, Dick, who are the key senators to watch on this whole matter? It's a little bit of a, of, of, of a funny question, because once they don't get 60, they won't get anybody. <laughs> In other words, if all they have is 59, nobody's going to walk the plank to vote for this bill. So it'll fall very quickly to the low 50s and the high 40s. The question is, what is the 60th vote? Now, Part of the 60th vote is holding Snow and Collins in line in Maine. That's one of the reasons we're putting all this money into advertising in Maine. The voters of Maine supported this bill before we began our advertising, but now they oppose it by 38 to 43. And we just need to keep piling it in to build up that margin to a point where Snow and Collins can't desert the party on this bill. And then there are the Democrats, and the people you have to work on are Nelson of Nebraska, Landrieu of Louisiana, Lincoln and Pryor of Arkansas, and uh, Bayh of Indiana, and Lieberman of Connecticut. Any one of those or two or three of those could provide the margin. But even that is a little simplistic, because it isn't just going to be the data in each state that's going to change it. You need national polling numbers. You need this to be radioactive nationwide so that the Democratic Party, not just in those states, but all over, realizes that they're throwing away their chances in 2010 by passing this bill in 2009. If Reed sees a sinking ship, do you think he would resort to reconciliation to get this through with 51 votes? If the circumstances were such that he would have to go with reconciliation, he won't get the 51 votes. In other words, it, as, if, he, if he's doing okay, he could get the 60, and then he'll pass it. But if things have gone so haywire that he can't get the 60, then he probably can't get 50 either. Dick, let's switch gears real quickly. Polls show Republican Mike Huckabee to, the, to be the leader among presidential hopefuls right now for 2012. In your analysis, is he indeed the leader? Well, I think that Huckabee has to break through the, what I call the ecclesiastic ghetto, uh, which is that I think voters trust him on values and think very highly of his personal morality. They like him as a person, uh, but they don't feel that he has all the expertise in economics or national defense. Now, in the aftermath of Lewinsky, we might have voted for that, but in the worst depression in our modern history, uh, we want someone who's conversant with economics. And I think that Mike certainly has the knowledge and the understanding of those issues. I just think he needs to be better at projecting it. On the other hand, the other contenders are in worse shape. Romney, I think, is virtually out of this race because he proposed a health care reform in Massachusetts, very similar to Obama's. It passed, and it's a disaster in Massachusetts now. And I think that Sarah Palin, while she's, her book sales are doing well, 
and, and I think she's an incredible woman. I think a lot of people are concerned when she resigned from the governorship of Alaska. So I think right now there is no front runner. And I think that's good because we're not going to focus on dividing our party. We'll focus on uniting it to defeat Obama. Let's talk about New York State. Uh, Andrew Cuomo against Rudy Giuliani, do you see it shaping up as a head-to-head -head match that way? No, definitely not. I don't think that Rudy will run for governor. I think there is some chance that he'll run against Kristen Gillibrand for the Senate. Uh, she was a congressman from the Albany area who was appointed by Governor Patterson to take Hillary Clinton's seat. And she has no statewide support, no statewide recognition. Rudy does. The polls currently show Rudy defeating her by about 13 points. Our chances, Ashley and Kathleen, of taking the Senate are really good. We have six seats that you can just like reach out and grab. Uh, Dodd is behind in Connecticut. Uh, Bo Biden, the son of the vice president, is behind Castle in Delaware. Um, the uh, Bennett, the appointed senator in Colorado, is behind Jane Norton, his challenger. Blanche Lincoln is running only even with her Democratic challenger in Arkansas. That's going to be a likely pickup. Um, Specter will probably lose his primary, and then the party will lose the general in Pennsylvania Pat Toomey. to Toomey. A uh, very, very good chance of a pickup there. Uh, Harry and, uh, and Harry Reid is behind in Nevada. So he got six right there. Then Rudy could run against Gillibrand, which gives you maybe a seventh. And Burris, in, in uh, Burris's replacement, whoever that is, in Illinois, is vulnerable to Kirk. So that would be an eighth pickup. Um, and then you start looking at some of the other seats. Boxer was elected with only the mid-50s. She could be defeated. Uh, Patty Murray in Washington got only 54% of the vote. Wyden in Oregon got only 55% of the vote. All of those could be possible pickups. Uh, and then you look at the New Jersey results and you wonder if Menendez might not be in trouble. Uh, and I think the Republicans will defend all of their vacant seats. So I really think that there is a very good chance that the Republicans will take control of both houses in 2010. Dick, what thoughts do you have on the race in Florida between incumbent uh, Governor Charlie Crist and Marco Rubio in the primary for the Senate seat? Well, rather than address that race directly because I don't really know both of the candidates. Let me say that this is not the year for the Republican Party to run centrists. Uh, this is not the year to triangulate, which is what I brought to the Clinton White House, because the voters right now are not in the mood for that. They want sharp contrast to, to Barack Obama. They want someone who's a vigorous apostle of free enterprise and low taxes to fight the socialist agenda of Obama. And uh, I think that in any case, I mean, the conventional wisdom was always go with the moderate because they have a better chance of winning. Now I think it's almost the opposite. The extent of this coming landslide is going to be beautiful to behold. Uh, in 1993, when we were warming up for the capture in 94 of both houses of Congress, there was a governor's race in Virginia and in New Jersey, just like there was this year. In Virginia, the Republican won 58 to 41, just like he did last year, j just like they did this year. And in New Jersey, the Republican won 49-48, and this year it was 49-45. So we are on a trajectory to reach where we got in 1994. So you seem to think that this could be, 2010 could be a repeat of 1994, or very close. I do. I do. All right, something definitely very interesting that we'll have to keep a close eye on for. And he's the man to do it. <laughs> Dick Morris, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, Dick. Pleasure seeing pleasure. you. And thank you for watching Newsmax TV. Sarah Palin's new book, Going Rogue in American Life, will be released on November 17th. You can be among the first to get your copy. Check out our incredible free offer for Sarah's new book. Just go to Newsmax.com and click on the top banner for this great offer. Act today.